Speechless. We're glad to have you here today. Tonight on Speechless, where you're going to see exclusive video of one of the Hobby Lobby family members um, explaining what the philosophy of Hobby Lobby and the legal counsel for Hobby Lobby explaining how they structured their business and why. Now, you won't see this anyplace else. Uh, the press was invited to the uh, Minnesota uh, Religious Freedom Forum, and I was the only one that came and filmed. <laughs> uh, so the other press was there, but uh, I, as far as I know, I'm the only one with film of these two people speaking, and I thought it was fascinating in light of the U.S. Supreme Court case that was heard on Tuesday. Um, I wanted to show you this to give you a deeper perspective and understanding of what's going on in this case. I think you'll find it fascinating if you're a person of faith or an atheist, uh, hearing um, uh, Michael McAfee uh, speak uh, for the company, why they do what they do, and then the Peter, uh, Peter Doublebauer, uh, describe how the company is formulated. So if you're an attorney, uh, financial planner, estate planner, uh, tax planner, you're going to want to hear how they structure the company. Even if you're not, it's uh, fascinating what they do and may give you ideas of what to do to structure a company. Uh, but also uh, just some of the struggle they went through to determine why and how to do what they needed to do to accomplish their goals which was uh, that the company was God's uh, and not the uh, human owners of the company. So it's a fascinating discussion that took place. Uh, but before we get into that, I want to update you on some legal issues that are going on in the courts and in the legislature. Of course, the legislature writes a law. The courts interprets what they write. Uh, but, you know, the big news... Uh, at the studio was that Ray Woodstrand, who was an employee here that was beaten up on the east side of St. Paul, he had some severe damage, uh, brain damage. Um, the individual who beat him up was sentenced to 16 years in prison. And of course, that was a double sentence, as my understanding, which I think uh, they will be, his attorney will be able to come and do a constitutional challenge on that. Uh, you know, if people who beat people up intentionally and cause damage need to have, somehow that deserves double sentence. I don't understand how that could work. It's an arbitrary judgment of the judge, uh, in this case, who is Joanna Smith, and, or Joanne Smith. And uh, what we should do is have our sentences being higher for somebody that intentionally beats somebody up and causes damage like this. I don't know what this makes this particularly more egregious than any other person who gets assaulted and, and has this brain damage. So uh, that will be an interesting sidelight to this case, but at least one person was found guilty. Now, if this person uh, here on this criminal charge it's too bad he didn't negotiate with police so we could find out who really did uh, and tell everything. Of course, we, we couldn't know for sure, but he decided not to spill the beans and not to indict anybody else, and now he's serving 16 years uh, for that. And so who knows, that may be a small price to pay for, uh, may have been threatened that uh, if he told what really happened, uh, he could have... Uh, been killed, who knows. But uh, the interesting aspect, this individual who was charged had a long record. The, the story is that um, he was taken out of school often by the police, and, but he was still continuing allowed in, allowed in, had a extensive track record, and probably shouldn't have been in public school. Uh, with all his uh, legal problems that he had. But I, I want to tie this in to another event that took place in St. Paul where there's a janitor who was uh, charged with uh, interfering with privacy, and I'm sure other charges may come, but there was a 
hearing, uh, there was a, the school, Monroe Elementary, where this incident took place, had a question and answer session, and I went down and filmed that. And in the process, one of the mothers spoke out, and so I want you to hear what this mom had to say. Uh, so uh, let's roll the tape. I had a point in 2011, okay? My son was 12 years old. One of your teachers, his dad, told me, no, he wasn't do anything like that. If Walter was here for over 30 years, I don't believe he did a thing like that. So, we're going to talk to him. And he'll say, he said that St. Paul was not easy to me. And said, well, it's cool to talk to him. But we got a, a case file for you. Then on top of that, they're going to tell me, well, we're going to have your son go to the bathroom on the second and third floor. We're going to have him go to the bathroom on the first floor. First of all, why is he using the kids' washroom in the first beginning? Okay? It wasn't no investigation. It was, they asked him a question. He said no and denied it. It was closed. If the school would have took the proper steps, this wouldn't have happened to another child. Plain and simple. This happened because did nobody care. So my son still had to go through it. And then when he finally got suspended or have, you want to say, February 20th, we didn't get reports until March 13th about the whole situation. This is something that I feel like the school really don't care. I mean, y'all go home, y'all kids is at a whole other school or grown and out of situation. But my kids got to go through this every single day. My son is super upset. And they come to find out my son ain't the only one he was supposed to be getting candy. All right, the, the piece I wanted you to hear that nobody cared. And this really came out as another uh, mother said, who's going to fess up? I want you to say, you guys made a mistake. Okay, own up to it. And here this mother was saying that their child in 2011 had a complaint and there was no investigation. It was his word against the teachers, basically just saying, I didn't do it. There was no discussion with the child as to what took place. And finding out that this uh, janitor came from another school that had uh, supposedly five incidences of uh, problems, uh, whatever they were. But the, 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 the issue here is that is nobody cares. Now, I, I want to talk about this case in relationship to the confusion that is going on, the purposeful confusion of our children and uh, what is going to be taught to them. Now, this is a 12-year-old uh, a, a person. This is a janitor uh, peeking in, doing something to children at the school. We don't know the full extent, having pornography, child pornography there. Uh, but I, I want you to understand, we're passing an anti-bullying bill, House File 826. And let's uh, put graphic 10 up just for a couple seconds. Uh, I want you to notice this bill amongst others. House file 1083, Senate file 1082, judicial, oh, I'm sorry, wrong one. House file 826, anti-bullying bill. Okay, you can go back to me. Uh, this bill, which is being supported, already passed in the House last year by Fisher and Lilly, who supported this anti-bullying bill, is set up to teach children this child's age at this Monroe Elementary about sodomy and that it's okay and that it's healthy and normal, okay, and, and it's not. And you can watch my uh, last week's show on the uh, ban on gay therapy bill that was going through and then also um, uh, the week before dealing with the anti-bullying bill in common core curriculum and 
You can go to the website and you look down there, youtube.com, Speechless MN, or just search Speechless and Sodomy. The show will come up. Uh, so why are we going after this janitor we're, when we're going to teach these kids this age in grade school that sodomy is okay? You know, it's just it's confusion all the way around. Uh, and we're also not teaching the health effects of sodomy, which are very, very detrimental to a person. So it's just beyond belief what's going on down at the legislature with this anti-bullying bill, which has nothing to do with anti-bullying. There's a lot better ways that protects everybody, not just the gay, lesbian community. So there's that effort to say this lifestyle is normal. It's, we, they want to normalize it, say it's okay, that it's not unhealthy, and it's not healthy for the heterosexual or the homosexual, <laughs> okay? So they're trying to create all this confusion going on. Uh, and also in that bill, anti-bullying bill, it's there to take away parental rights. That's the purpose of that. So I wanted to show you what was going on in St. Paul to tie in this dynamic of how can we go after this janitor or any other teacher uh, when we're teaching our kids that it's okay. So when the incident happens to them or an incident happens to them, they're not going to know what to do. You know, and so huge, huge dichotomy. Now, the uh, let's go back to graphic 10, uh, the ban on gay therapy, House File 1906, Senate File 1727, uh, the third one down. That bill was rejected, uh, fortunately, uh, even though there was a strong petition for it. Uh, Kevin Peterson, who was on the show last week, and his group uh, were successful in getting that defeated for now. Folks, elections matter. Um, it's, it's very important that you understand elections matter. These issues would not be up and being dealt with if the Democrats weren't in power. you got to understand these are anti-family, anti-health, anti-parental uh, choice, parental teaching, uh, parental authority. These bills are designed to destroy the family. That is the intent. And if you look at the authors on this bill, you'll understand why. Uh, also, uh, in that, and I'm going to tie, okay, and then there's the baby DNA bill. Uh, House file 2526, Senate file 2047. It looks like this one's going through. This takes away... That's the fourth one down there. This takes away parental rights again in controlling your own DNA. And your kid's DNA will be out there. It will be sold. Research will be done. It. You have no authority over it. It's terrible what this bill is going to do and take away parental rights. If you want your baby DNA, have it with your doctor. The state doesn't need it. State doesn't need it at all. If there's a problem you can, and you want to turn your DNA to the state, that's up to you. It's not up to the state to just take it uh, without your permission. That's a clear violation of our Constitution and constitutional rights. And, uh, you know, we'll see what happens with that. But again, who's pushing this? Health and Human Services controlled by the Democrats. The Republicans are in power. This would not be happening. We wouldn't have to be fighting these taking away our parental rights. All right. So you see the, the, the public schools teaching sexual promiscuity um, to the grade schoolers. They grow up. They have no restraint on their actions. And you get a Ray Woodstrand scenario. I'm tying a lot of pieces together here in order to get there. But that's the reality. The morality of our public schools has gone so far down the hill uh, that it's, I mean, we're in a crisis situation in our public schools. They don't even tell you what's going on as far as the crime, the gun shootings, uh, until the press leaks it out. Then they let you know. And same with this... Uh, uh, what the mother was saying as far as information regarding this um, 
the janitor, uh, was she gave some dates here. She said um, it happened February 20th. It wasn't told about until March 13th, and now they're having a uh, hearing on the, uh, this was Monday, uh, a public information session on Monday. Uh, so, and that was because the pressure of the press that, that was put on there. So, big problem. Pay attention to what's going on, and uh, we'll go from there. Now, what I want to watch now is uh, we're going to go into Hobby Lobby. These are some long videos, but you, you need to see them. And the first person that was speaking is Michael McAfee, and he's the director of faith initiatives for Hobby Lobby. And uh, this Hobby Lobby is a multi-billion dollar corporation. It's going to open a store in Maplewood, uh, probably take a couple years, a year and a half or so, but right uh, just east of Maplewood Mall on County Road uh, by Old Country Buffet. Minimum wage, $14 an hour for that company. And it's a strong family-run company, and Obama and Obama care or the Affordable Health Care Act is, is out there to destroy them and taking away their religious freedoms. And this person has, a, this company has a foundation that has over 4,000 antiquities, uh, which includes some of the rarest and most valuable biblical and classical pieces ever assembled under one roof. They're building a museum uh, to hold this information. But this man here, who was part of the family, married into the family, is in charge of that. And I think he has some fantastic statements to, to say here. So let's listen to about their perspective of their company and why they exist. Well, good morning. Thank you for allowing me to be here. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, it is great to be here uh, with you all today. Um, first time to Minnesota, but we share a mutual love in Adrian Peterson, the running back for the Vikings, who comes from the University of Oklahoma. He's uh, one of our favorite sons. So um, I, I'm I'm thrilled to be with you here this morning. Uh, this is uh, such a blessing to get to tell you the story uh, of Hobby Lobby, how it's risen to where it is today, and and why we're now in the, the court case that we are. Uh, Hobby Lobby uh, is a privately owned company uh, started by David Green and, and his family, and uh, Steve Green is the president of Hobby Lobby. And the second son of the founder, David Green. And uh, I've grown up my, my entire life around the Green family. Uh, Steve's daughter, Lauren, as she mentioned, we were childhood best friends and uh, high school sweethearts. We actually met second grade in Sunday school and uh, have been married for many years now and, uh, and uh, am grateful that she got to be here today. And Steve looks really nice in this picture, but, uh, but when Lauren and I started dating, I remember him looking a little bit different, something a little bit more a little more like this. So, <laughs> the story of Hobby Lobby begins with the way that God worked in the life of David Green, who I call Grandpa Green. Grandpa Green grew up as one of six children to a, a pastor and his wife, and, and they're relatively poor, never pastored a church of more than a hundred people. And so, um, the real wealth that they passed on to their children was that of their faith in Jesus Christ. And there was a poem a poem that his mother would often quote to him, and it said this, Only one life, and it soon will pass. Only what's done for Christ will last. And so uh, all of Grandpa's uh, brothers and sisters went into full-time ministry, either as pastors or pastor's wives or evangelists, but God gave Grandpa uh, a real passion for retail. And so he, uh, he began Hobby Lobby. Uh, you know it today as the nation's privately owned arts and crafts store in the country. However, it began right here in, uh, in the living room at, at Grandpa's home. And uh, they, would, uh, they were wanting to glue frames together so that people could have decorative frames uh, to place in their homes. And so I think Grandma Green, tired of her two troublemaking boys, put them to work. They were the ones that would glue the frames together and, uh, so, so that Grandpa could sell them. And uh, while she did, Aunt Darcy, who was the princess of the family, as you can tell, played with crowns in a room and played with dolls and things like that, which actually served as her training ground because now she's over the art department at Hobby Lobby. And so truly everyone was working on the company at that time. And so God began to grow the company. Uh, in 1975, Grandpa felt like it was time to really go all in. And so uh, opened uh, the first Hobby Lobby store in 1973. And a couple years later, 
um, went all in. Uh, when he went full time, the year before, they had done $150,000 worth of sales. And the following year, they did five times that, $750,000 worth of sales. So we saw where the Lord blessed Grandpa uh, for taking that little step of faith and going full time. And every year since then, we've seen Hobby Lobbies continue to grow. Uh, but in 1985, 1985, Hobby Lobby had a hard year. Hobby Lobby had a hard year. The oil boom had busted in Oklahoma, and a lot of people in our area were struggling. And, uh, and Grandpa called a family meeting, brought the, uh, our parents' generation basically together, and, and said, I don't know how we're going to make it. I don't know what we're going to be able to do. And uh, um, he remembers, Grandpa, how he crawled under his desk a lot that year and spent hours in prayer asking God, God, I can't save this company. If you want this company to go, it's, you're going to have to do that. I can't do it. And it became real that year. Hobby Lobby is not our company. Hobby Lobby is God's company. 1 Corinthians 4, 7 says, What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? God used that experience to help our family. See, we did not have the right to run this business the way we want, but we are to run this business how God wants. You never want to go through fires like that in your life. You never want to go through trials, but you wouldn't trade what you learned and the way you were refined for anything in the world. Hobby Lobby has since adopted a statement of purpose, and it begins with this. The first statement is honoring the Lord in all we do by operating our business in a manner consistent with biblical principles. Grandpa says it like this, that there are decisions every day that we have to make, and we have to ask the question, is this what Christ would have us do? Sometimes God even tests us in terms of dollars and cents. But that's definitely happened for Hobby Lobby and definitely happened in 1985. We learned that trying to honor the Lord isn't just based on a hunch or even our human wisdom, but based on the words that God has spoken to us. And, uh, and so we want our company to be honoring, honoring to God in every way and in any way we can so that we can fulfill Colossians 3.23, that whatever our hand finds to do, that we might work heartily as if working for the Lord and not for man. And so our work, your work, is primarily about glorifying God. Your work is not a bottom line. Your bottom line is Jesus. Our final statement of purpose is this. We believe that it is by God's grace and provision that Hobby Lobby has endured. He has been faithful in the past, and we trust him for the future. This was proven to us in 1985 when it looked like everything was going to collapse. All the effort, all the time, all of the money that our family had invested in the company looked like it was going to collapse and be for naught. But God was the one. God is primarily responsible for the past of Hobby Lobby and the future of Hobby Lobby. So this is where God has taken the company since this day. Since this day, we now have over 500 stores across the nation are opening up more this year than any year before, though unfortunately, no immediate plans for St. Paul, Minneapolis, but we can continue praying for that. However, that's not all God has done in and through our business. Hobby Lobby has used profits to support many Christian ministries and humanitarian efforts all over the world. In 1997 was the year that our giving began to, to escalate, that we, we'd all you know, been taught to tithe to our local churches and even given to some things as a, as a company, but we really began to step up our game that year. The, be, this began with purchasing uh, newspaper ads, which would celebrate Jesus' birth at Christmas and his resurrection at Easter time. But this moved quickly to supporting missions organizations such as uh, One Hope, formerly known as Book of Hope, uh, Every Home for Christ, Christ for All Nations, the YouVersion Bible app, Oral Roberts University, and Passages, the Green Collection, and Bible Museum to be named at a later date. Uh, we have continued to escalate the giving, and today we give half of our profits to Christian ministries. You may be... <laughs> Praise God. Because you may be wondering, how, how are you able to do that? How can you do that? And we can't. We can't do that. God, God has blessed us, and so now we have the responsibility and the blessing to bless others. Uh, God has been faithful to us, and we want to be faithful to him with our future. And this not only includes the organizations that we support, but we see the employees that, as those that God has entrusted to our care. In 2000, Hobby Lobby hired a full-time chaplain uh, to serve uh, the needs of our employees. Today, we have three full-time chaplains, and they offer not only Bible studies, but Dave Ramsey courses to help uh, employees at corporate better know how to handle their finances while they're on the clock, and Peacemakers, which helps them in conflict resolution, both at work and at home in those relationships. Um, at the corporate office in 2010, we opened a, a company clinic um, that provides free health care to many of our employees. Uh, also, the minimum wage of the U.S. government is something like $7.25 an hour. 
but we have our own minimum wage. We have no full-time employee that makes below $14 an hour. And so, and additionally, you may know this, to allow employees both time with their families and time to go to worship services if they choose to do so, all Hobby Lobby stores are closed on Sundays. And as well, all Hobby Lobby stores close at 8 p.m. on the other days of the week. Hobby Lobby has only opened, uh, I only have a little bit of time, so please, no more applause. I want to make sure I get through all of this. Hobby Lobby is only open 66 hours per week. We are not aware of any other retailer of our size that is only open that many hours. Now, but bear in mind, this is a process spanning over four decades now. This is not something that happened overnight. For instance, in 1998, the family knew it was the right thing to do to close stores on Sunday so that people could spend time with their families or go to worship services if they chose to do so. But we didn't close all the stores at once. We took, you know, we're walking away from Sunday hours. Those are some of the most profitable hours of the week. At the time, Hobby Lobby was making $100 million on Sundays that we would be walking away from. And so, um, as a result, and that was with half as many stores. And so, as a result, we, we said, okay, we'll close in Nebraska because out of our 300 stores, three were in Nebraska. So, we'll try it in Nebraska and see how it goes. And then, uh, and God kind of nudged Grandpa and said, oh, so you're going to see how it goes. You're going to see if I bless you and then decide if you're going to be faithful. And so um, it took two years, but finally in 2000, we closed all the stores in the biggest state, Texas. And so um, once we did, though, we saw that the Lord increased sales, that it was the Lord again testing us to see if we were going to be faithful to him. And so uh, my father-in-law would say it like this, that our faith in Jesus influences every decision we make. This company is not ours to do whatever we want. He would also say we don't set our Christianity on the shelf when we walk into work. It is part of our work. It is a form of our worship. As a Christian, that means we are following after Christ. So with every decision, it should be directed by Christ who lives within us and his word he's given to us. This business has been blessed by God. He's given the family the skills, the ability, the opportunity, the time, the ideas, So for us to lay claim on that as if it was our own would be wrong. All these things have come from God. So this is the story of Hobby Lobby from 1972 to to present day. Now, enter the Affordable Care Act, uh, more commonly known as Obamacare. Uh, This mandate requires our company to provide and to pay for contraceptives. Now, we have no objection to offering pregnancy preventive contraceptives, though we greatly respect any person or company who does. We do, however, object to a mandate that we provide and pay for any contraceptive that has the potential to destroy a fertilized egg and thus ending a human life. This left us with a decision, honor God or honor the United States government. So here's the big question. Do for-profit businesses have religious rights? The claim the government is making is that because Hobby Lobby is a for-profit business and is incorporated, we do not have any religious rights. Our company has religious rights as individuals, our family, excuse me, has individual rights as individuals, but Hobby Lobby does not have their first freedom. Our family trustees could be taken to jail if Hobby Lobby did not pay its taxes or comply within the law. Yet the government is asking our family to keep our faith out of our business. They are saying your business is not God's business. Your business is the government's business. And this country was founded upon freedom. The Bill of Rights was adopted in 1789 as the foundation for our first freedoms. And the first right on there, and thus the first freedom as our country, is as follows. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Separation of church and state was to protect the church from the state. The First Amendment then includes freedom of free speech, freedom of assembly, but even before those rights, the right of religious freedom was intended to be our cornerstone. So what are we to do as a company? Well, Grandpa called a meeting. It was like what it was like in 1985 all over again. Um, everyone in, in our generation was asked to get babysitters, and, uh, and the family trustees didn't make the decision on their own, but brought to the family kind of what was going on, and gave it to us to decide um, to spend time in prayer together, to read scripture together, and to ask God, Lord, what would you have us do as a company? And uh, there were basically three options on the table. Option number one, provide no health care for employees. Though this would cost the family rough, 
co the family company roughly $30 million a year in penalties, the, that paled in comparison to the impact it could have on our employees who would be without coverage. They would be completely on their own to find their own health insurance. This option was unacceptable and was immediately taken off the table by the family. So option number two, violate our religious beliefs while protesting our right to our first freedom. This would have been the option to comply within the law, which would include providing and paying for the drugs that violate our Christian values. This option included no financial cost to the family or to the employees. We would file the lawsuit, but in the meantime, we would be providing and paying for pills that could terminate the lives of unborn children. As Christians, this option was also unacceptable and was taken off the table by the family. Our third option was exercise our religious beliefs while protesting our right to our first freedom. This option includes a strict penalty once the Affordable Care Act goes into effect. And by strict penalty, I mean $100 per person per day on the plan, which comes out with our employees to roughly $1.5 million per day. So to remind you, if we provide zero health insurance for our employees, we pay a once a year fine of $30 million and they're left on their own. But if we provide great health care for our employees, help them, but don't provide these three pills that are potentially abortive, we pay $1.5 million a day, totaling over half a billion dollars in a year. That comes, uh, so what were we to do? We prayed and read scripture. In Daniel chapter three, there's a story of King Nebuchadnezzar who made an image of gold. And he calls all of his officials in the country to come and worship, fall down um, at this image and to worship it once the trumpet is blasted. And so everyone did, uh, and he, in verse six he says, whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be cast into a burning fiery furnace. So everyone comes, all the officials come, the trumpet is blasted. And everyone falls down and worships, except for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Nebuchadnezzar, furious in his rage, commanded that they be brought before him. And they were, when they were brought before his throne, he asked, Is it true that do you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image? If you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is this God who will deliver you out of my hands? And in Daniel 3, 17 and 19, their response was this. If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to obey the law of the land. Why? Because it violated their God what had given him. The first of the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20 are, you shall have no other gods before me, and you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I the, am the Lord your God and am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments." You see, when we come across trials and lies, there are three possible outcomes that can come from that. Number one, we may skip the trial. This happened in Daniel chapter one. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were with Daniel. There was a, they were told to eat the king's meat. They asked instead if they could eat vegetables, and they were allowed to. Ten days later, it was seen that they were in better health, and so they were continued allowed to eat vegetables. The trial was skipped. Nothing happened. Number two, they were saved from a trial. A trial came to pass, but God saved them from the pain. And this is, of course, what happened with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, that they were thrown into the fiery furnace, tied hand and foot, and literally danced in the fire with the pre-incarnate Christ who saved them from the flames. When they came out, they didn't even smell like fire. So sometimes you can be saved when you're walking into a fire. And, but there is a third option, and that's to suffer through a trial. A trial comes to pass, and God allows you to suffer. Sometimes God puts us through trials and doesn't save us from the pain and suffering. He allows people he loves to go through hard times as a way of refining them, of spreading his name and bringing glory to himself. And is there any better example of this than our Lord Jesus Christ? John 1 tells us Jesus was with God in the beginning. Everything was made for him and through him. Yet Christ left his home in heaven where he was properly worshipped, humbled himself, and came to earth, where instead of being worshipped as he said, he suffered. He 
suffered on our behalf so that we might be forgiven of our sins and we might have a hope of, of life with him. In 1 Peter 2.20, it shows how this now gives us purpose in our suffering. It says, but if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Sometimes God calls us to suffer. Yet our God, the one true God, has already suffered far beyond what any of us would have to suffer if we were in Christ, and that is the wrath of God. God is not impressed with the amount of success that we have. What he is looking for is our faithfulness. Are we going to live our life faithful? Are we going to choose to make the tough decisions and let God be God? He has given us a precious gift, the precious gift of his word. The question for us then became not how do we avoid suffering. The question became how do we glorify God? As I mentioned, that quote Grandpa gave earlier, every day there are decisions that we have to make where we ask, is this what Christ would have us do? There are many times God tests us in terms of dollars and cents. And as Daniel 3, we saw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew God is able to deliver us. But even if he doesn't, God's still God. And you're not, O king. Today we are engaged in a lawsuit against the federal government. We never intended nor wanted this fight. We love our country. We are patriots and believe in liberty. We hold fast to the Constitution and our Bill of Rights, and our first freedom is the right to practice whatever religion we are convicted of. For the government to force a company to do something that goes against their religious right is a violation of our most precious cornerstone freedom, the right of religious liberty. So let me be clear, this is not just a Christian issue. This is an issue for people of all faiths. We stand for all Americans, Christian or not, to have religious freedoms. We pray for our city, state, and national leaders. They are not our enemy. The argument from the government is that we are prohibiting the freedom of women who want access to these pills. And the fact that we do not provide these pills does nothing to prevent our employees from buying them on their own. Our Christian conscience prevents us from buying these drugs for them. The government has claimed that we are seeking this exemption because we do not want our employees to have good quality health care. But we are not involved in this court case because we don't want our employees to have great health care, but because the government is forcing us to choose between obeying the law of the land or obeying the law of God's word. In Philippians 3.20, our citizenship is in heaven. Our hope is not in the Supreme Court then, but our hope is in our Supreme Christ. So the big takeaway I hope for you is this, is your business is God's business. That he holds it, he owns it. And it's a form of worship that you have to him. And so whatever step that is, Peter's going to come in, in just a second and talk about whatever step that is for you, that's that next baby step that you have. And if you feel like you've made some mistakes, the Lord forgives us for those. And so I pray that you would see your work as a form of worship. It is not your own to do whatever you want. What we have, we've received from him. Many today are worried about being on the right or the wrong side of history, but history is not what we see. History is going to be rewritten by the eternal God. So if you're on the side of the eternal God, you're on the right side of history. We have only one life, and it soon will pass. Only what's done for Christ will last. Thank you. Wow, there was so much stuff in there, uh, and I just want to focus on a couple things. First of all, uh, Senator Wigger, Senator Lilly, Senator Fish, or <laughs> Representative Lilly, Representative Fisher, wherever these guys go to church, these pastors of these churches need to talk to these representatives and say, hey, straighten up. Um, because these guys are proclaiming believers in Christ, and they these people at this corporation, in my opinion, know more than the pastors at, for these uh, senators and representatives. Uh, uh, so, I mean, those pastors need to stand up and say, hey guys, straighten up. You're violating God's word. You're supporting this terrible act that is violating what you say is your own religious convictions. And of course, they're just you know, uh, something's wrong with these pastors that are letting these guys, Wigger, Senator Wigger, Representative Lilly, and Peter Fisher remain in their church. 
uh, they should be kicked out for what they're doing and how they're destroying the family. And, you know, Hobby Lobby, I am so excited that you're coming to town. I mean, your, ten, your minimum wage is $10.10 above the state's minimum wage. But what this bill is doing is taking away uh, more money, not only from the employees, the $30 million from the employees, the employee at, at best, the best case scenario, then the employees will have to go out and sign up to the government coverage and pay even more than they would otherwise. So it makes this $14 an hour minimum wage that Hobby Lobby pays and makes it even less. I, I mean, and it just, it, it eats it all up. Uh, just, th just think of these people that don't pay any more than uh, the minimum wage and what it's going to do to those employees. This is bad news, but I really appreciate this company and they're coming into Maplewood. Uh, they have a place in Woodbury right now just off of Highway 19 and 94, but they're coming into Maplewood, which in my opinion, it's the, the, the pit of hell. Uh, this is where a lot of the dirty work uh, is being accomplished through our representatives and centers. Uh, to destroy the family, and unfortunately, the church in Maplewood area is silent and not speaking out against these people and not organizing against them. And you know, uh, Hobby Lobby, you're going to be a shining beacon compared to uh, these people. So welcome, and uh, it was a fantastic to hear your philosophy and what you have to say. Next, we're going to listen to the legal counsel of uh, Hobby Lobby, just a portion of it, but I think it's fascinating uh, for you attorneys, accountants, state planners to hear what they did and how they structured their company and why and what they're willing to do to jeopardize that status. So let's hear what uh, Peter uh, Doublebauer uh, has to say. What we ended up doing was the family got together and at this point in time, while we had three generations of family, the Green family, we only had two generations that actually had ownership of our company. David and Barbara Green, the founders of the company, had the lion's share of ownership, the controlling interests, and their children had various shares, their three children, which made up the entire ownership of our company. And when David said he wanted to give away this company to God, he talked to the family and everybody agreed we needed to do that. And in order to do that, everyone had to give up their interest in the company. You know, that's a huge deal. And what we're really talking about is not the day-to-day -day control of the company. What we're really talking about is the value of the company. What happens, you know, Family businesses, they don't have a really good track record. I don't care where you are. Family businesses just don't have a good track record. And at the end of the day, the reason they don't be, is because it boils down to money. So we've really taken that off the table for the family. Is this the Green family's company or is this God's company? So what the family did was everybody... We created a trust, and all the voting stock of our company went into the Green Management Trust. So David and Barbara, who owned the controlling interests of that company, gave up their right to control the company. And the trustees of this trust are all of the five um, previous owners of Hobby Lobby, David and Barbara and their three children and each of them has one vote. It's a complicated document, and I've spent lots of time speaking with Melissa Coleman about this because she's anticipating lots of questions. But I, I, I want you to know that what we did by putting this in the voting stock in this management trust is essentially gave everybody the right to make those decisions by a majority or a supermajority vote of the company. And if there were any differences that couldn't be done, we also had or decided upon, we had provisions that would allow for that. But what we did, what we worked on extremely hard was to make sure that no one person or no set of people could game the trust. In the event 
Hobby Lobby sells, whether it's 10% uh, of the company or more, the assets that come to the company as a result of that sell are required to go to a foundation, a Green Family Foundation. And that foundation has been created for one purpose. It shall always have a mission to create, support, and foster Christian ministries to educate others in the Word of God and to do any other things necessary and appropriate for, for, for fulfilling the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and whose purpose is consistent with the Green Management Trust purpose, vision, mission, and value statement, which they all sign. That's the voting stock. Then you have non-voting stock. And that non-voting stock was also divided among the family members. And each of them has their own um, estate vehicles by which they put their voting stock and all their assets in for purposes of estate planning. And we ended up taking that non-voting stock that everybody had, put it in an irrevocable trust for each one of them. And in the event of the dissolution of the company or the sale of the company, the value of that non-voting stock is divided in one of two ways. 90% of that non-voting stock goes to the trust and therefore goes to Christian ministries. 10% either goes to Christian ministries the same way, or it can be used for one of two things, and that is the health or the education of a family member. And in order to get to that point, it wasn't just generation one and generation two, but it was also the many generation three members that had grown over the years since I'd been there. And every single one of them agreed to this. That's the challenge that I'm giving you today. That's the challenge that the Green family is giving you today. And you, you might think, well, look at all this money that they have accumulated. Look at the size of this company. And are there certain ways that you can game this so that everybody gets wealthy, so that my kids get the money that they deserve or that they might need? And the answer to that is we, had a, we, we, we have a, um, uh, a way to do that fairly. And that is, a Green family member, they can come to work for the company, just like me. They do have one benefit, and that is they cannot make more than one and a half times what the going rate would be for that position. That's it. They have opportunity, just like you. It's a bold step, and it's taken a long time for us to get there. But you can do this. You can do this. I am so blessed to have spent the last 17 years working with this family. Um, I, I've got to tell you, as a Christian, I would not be, I would not have the strength of faith today that I have but for watching this family operate. And what Michael had told you earlier, every bit of that is who this family is. They walk in lockstep with each other in their faith, in their journeys, in their love of Jesus Christ. Joe mentioned earlier about tolerance. And there's a case right now, one of the many cases that... Um, is fighting this HHS mandate. And this case is um, out of Florida. And a federal district judge in Florida, in her opening analysis, said this. And it was just beautiful. Religious tolerance serves as an important foundational tenet in the governance of any society. A commonly misunderstood term, to tolerate, does not mean with uh, which to agree. It does not mean to understand. And it most certainly does not mean to adopt a belief as one's own. By definition, to tolerate means to recognize and respect others' beliefs, practices, etc., without sharing them. That's who we are at Hobby Lobby. 
And I want to, in the last few moments I have, I want to tell you a story. I want to, and I've never told this story. I've told it to some close friends, but I've really never told this story publicly. But I have to tell this today because I want you to know about the boldness that I see every day. And we, um, we have stores all across the country, and years ago we used to bring our managers in, all of them at once. But we've changed that format, and now um, every, every so often we bring in um, a group of co-managers. They're kind of like training managers, and we bring them in, and we kind of put on our dog and pony for them, and, and we tell them about who we are and what we do and how we're there to serve them. They're the most important person in the company because of the job they have, and that's true. The store manager's job is the toughest job in the company. And so um, I don't attend those very often, and one day I was walking down the hall, and our CFO was walking towards me, and he said, Peter, have you been to the co-manager meeting yet? And I said, no. He said, well, um, one of our corporate chaplains, as she was talking to him, she gives her testimony, and she ends up praying and doing an altar call and asking them if anybody wants to know the Lord Jesus Christ, say this prayer. So I'm a little nervous being the corporate lawyer, of course. I think you can appreciate this. So I thought, okay, well, they're coming in next week, and, and there were five groups that were coming over five weeks. So the next week I went in there, I sat there, and lo and behold, there she is. She prays the sinner's prayer with all these people in this room. And I'm thinking, oh, gosh, this is a lawsuit waiting to happen. So I immediately went to um, our uh, vice president over operations and said, we got to get with David. I've got to talk to him about this. So we go sit in his office, and, and I said, you know, David, please don't kill the messenger. But Debbie is in there. All these people are there. They're, it's a confined audience. They can't leave. She gives the, her testimony. Then she asks people, for those that don't know Jesus Christ, say this prayer with me. And, and I'm thinking, gosh, you know, we never fire anybody as a result of their beliefs or lack thereof. But, you know, there's going to be people in this room that are going to get terminated. No question about it. They're going to leave or something, and they're going to end up suing us. And one of the reasons they're going to say they left was because they were forced to sit in this meeting and listen to this woman preach. And even though they weren't fired for that, a jury's going to look at this, and they may get all of these, and it's going to cost us millions of dollars in legal fees or damages or something. And, you know, maybe there's something else we can do. Maybe she can say, if you want to know Christ, here's my phone number, or go down the hall, there's my office, come see me. You know, there's got to be a way we can do this. And this whole time I'm telling David this, he kind of has this little sheepish grin on his face. And, I, you know, I know I am, I, I, I'm getting ready to get some kind of answer that I don't want to hear, or like you're fired. Um, so... Anyway, I finished my story, and he looks at me, and, and um, he says, you know, I, I appreciate you, you're doing your job. Thank you very much. And he looks at the vice president of store operations, and he says, Kenny, tell me, how many meetings have we had so far? And Kenny says, well, we've had uh, two. And David says, um, tell me, how many people have turned their life over to Christ in these meetings? And Kenny said, eight. And David looked at me. And he said, Peter, can you tell me the price of a soul? In the immortal words of Winston Churchill, never, ever, 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 ever give up. Never give up. Never give up. Never give up. God bless you. Well, they are fighters, and every person that believes in liberty 
and our Constitution should be grateful for Hobby Lobby and what they're doing um, to defend everybody's liberties. And, you know, as they say, the foundation is the religious liberties. That's the First Amendment, first uh, piece of the First Amendment where you have religious liberties. And if that core is taken away from our Constitution, the rest falls. And because if you don't have freedom of religion, you don't have freedom of speech, you don't have any of the other things. And so it's a significant case that's coming down. And people, we need to be on our knees in prayer that the Supreme Court answers this correctly, that our religious liberties are retained. Here's a company that takes care of the employees, but says, hey, you know, we got four things in this bill that we are conscientiously objecting to that will kill babies uh, and make babies uh, abort and kill life. And we can't do that, and that's our religion, and you can't force us to do that. While in the meantime, they're getting great health care uh, uh, for their employees and great uh, salaries. Uh, so uh, this is what's coming. Um, Hobby Lobby's coming to Minnesota. They'll have a lot bigger fight here uh, than what they're going through now, I believe. But, uh, hey, you know they're sticking up. All right, we are going live in St. Paul uh, next week. So get that message out. And remember, if you don't uh, stand up for other people's liberties, like Hobby Lobby, who's going to stand up for yours? And good people don't do nothing. Uh, in Hobby Lobby, you're good people. Uh, God bless and have a great week. Your love.